I have many conversations. Um, and one of the things I do is every time I go to the river, I get down on my knees and I cup my hands and I get some water in my hands from the river and put it on my face. And I tell the river, I love you. I, I love her. And, and I think um, for me, that's, that's a really strong, powerful, emotional connection. Um, yeah, I, I have these conversations about, you know, just keep going. We're, we're, we, you know, we're doing everything we can for you. And, and uh, I, I talk to her as a person and, and the conversation is different each time. Um, I, I would tell her right now that a lot of people care and don't give up. That's beautiful. Yeah, that's really powerful connection. Hello, my friends. This is Kathy, the library hunter. And as you might know, Library Hunter is a YouTube channel focused on exploring libraries, bookstores, and the fascinating universe of reading. And today I'm honored to have a very special guest, Dave, to our channel, and he will guide us to uncover the stories behind his book, Living River, The Promise of the Mighty Colorado. So now please allow me to take a moment to introduce Dave. Dave Showalter is a conservation, conservation photographer who is focused on the American West. Dave works throughout the ecosystem of the Intermountain West and has published two books prior to Living River, which are Sage Spirit, The American West at the Crossroads, published by Braided River, and The Player Thunder, The Colorado River's Great Plains, published by the Skyline Press. Dave is a senior fellow of the International League of Conservation Photographers and a longtime contributor and partner of the Flight Basin Time Lapse. Dave speak, seeks to take readers on a journey to see ourselves as part of nature and a community, that all living things in gendering empathy, caring, love of the nature world, and the genesis of the meaning of conservation. And today we're going to hear some backstories behind Dave's latest book, Living River, which is in my hand right now. Um, Living River, The Promise of Mighty Colorado. It is the winner of the 2023 National Outdoor Book Award in Nature and the Environment. It's about a journey through the Colorado River from its headwaters to its delta. It's an insightful exploration of the Colorado River, highlighting the river's impact on the landscape of, and the diverse wildlife that it supports. Through his narrative and photography, Dave leads us to reflect on the river's history and the role it has played in shaping the American West. Now, as you can see, we're in an online meeting because Dave is based in Awada, Colorado, and I'm based in Los Angeles, California. So I'm so honored to have Dave join me today to celebrate the mighty Colorado River. Welcome, Dave. That's very nice. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you. So Dave, last month, I was so lucky to have attended one of your book lunch events during your tour and had a brief conversation with you. You shared your wonderful stories of your multi-year projects in hiking, biking, rafting, and adventuring through the watershed. So how long did it take you from starting this project to finally finishing the book? Yeah, I could answer that a couple of ways. Um, I officially seven years of of work about five year parts of five years were the field work you know we had the pandemic and mm -hmm. a bunch of other challenges in there as well um but i started in 2016 and before that um had been exploring throughout the west for three decades or so um so i would say all of you know th those explorations also informed this project um Plus the work with Platte Basin time lapse, you know, I think it's just a confluence of things that that led to this point where you start to know so much about the Colorado River 
Um, and I started seeing stories that didn't match up with my experiences and I felt compelled to tell my own story. So that's what led me here. Yeah, I'm sure that the, the stories of the river also evolves during the, the multiple years, like seven or more than that, right? Yeah, totally. Um, I think starting out, I didn't know what I didn't know. And uh, I spent about two years just trying to see as much of the watershed as I could and mm -hmm. to meet people who I thought could help carry the story. And ultimately, um, we we told a big part of the story through these amazing people that we call river keepers who are building community in their own parts of the watershed. And uh, and I think that's a, a, a really important aspect um, that, you know, readers can see themselves through others um, doing great work. Mm -hmm. That's great. So when reading your book, I'm always amazed by your ways of visual storytelling. For example, I like your story of the sacred land and river of Bears Ears National Monument and the San, San Juan River. So can you share a little bit about the idea of um, that area and the uh, co-tribal management of the Bears Ears? Sure. So Bears Ears is in Southeast Utah and um, it uh, has the largest archeological record. I could show a couple of pictures while I talk if you'd like. Um, let me do a screen share here if I can. And so, here we go. Can you see that? Yes, we can see it. So here's our book cover uh, in the Grand Canyon. This is me in the field in Black Canyon of the Gunnison journaling next to the river in a very constricted space. And then we come to Bears Ears and this was the summer gathering in 2019 of the five tribe coalition, Utah Dene uh, The five tribes are Navajo, uh, Zuni, Hopi, Ute and Ute Mountain Ute. And these, these tribes didn't used to get along, but they came together beautifully for the protection of Bears Ears. And this is a very strong alliance today. And Bears Ears has the largest archeological uh, record of the ancestral Puebloan people who left the canyons uh, of this region about 1200 years ago. And, mm -hmm. uh, and I, I've worked very closely with Cynthia Wilson and her family and others Cynthia is this amazing human being in, in her Hogan, which is uh, the womb of Mother Earth, lined with juniper from, from Bears Ears. And at the time I met Cynthia, she was the traditional foods coordinator for Utah Denebakea, so helping other families grow their own traditional foods gardens, um, corn, beans, squash, and she's holding the Bears Ears potato. And, um, and I'll also add that one of the big challenges here is that um, uh, Indigenous people do not a lot of indigenous people do not have access to clean water. This is Cynthia's father, Henry Sr., who has to go every day to fill this tank, this giant tank, 325 gallons of water for the family, horses, uh, sheep, and the traditional foods garden. And you can see the cars. It's it's a half hour to fill the tank, so it's that's about a two and a half hour line. Um, and you mentioned co-tribal management. So Bears Ears National Monument is now a pilot uh, project for um, starting to uh, integrate co-tribal management and, and listen to Native American people as they tell their stories. Um, I don't know what happened to my picture there, but um, anyway, you get, you get the idea. So uh, I, think, I think everybody benefits if we uh, are more diverse in our understanding of these sacred spaces, and uh, and and you know, these are the historic ancestral sacred homelands of these Native American folks, and and I think nothing but good can come from co-tribal management. I haven't been to the Bears Ears National Monument, but I, now I feel like I must go visit because it's like blending the ecological richness with deep cultural and historical roots. Um, and so, so beautiful, unbelievably beautiful landscape. Mm -hmm. So also um, in your book, there is a, another whole chapter about the Grand Canyon. I love those 
beautiful photos from your eight day Grand Canyon expedition in a is a, a motorized jade rig boat is that right yeah I did a motorized raft trip with Audubon Rockies uh, one of my partners in the book and that particular trip um, I started that journey uh, by flying over the Grand Canyon with with Lighthawk and then we did we floated it with Audubon and then after that um, uh, with my wife and some friends we backpacked uh, to the bottom of the Grand Canyon and so that was a uh, that was a really rich experience to spend three weeks in in the environs of the Grand Canyon. Three weeks, wow. Yeah. So also it's it's closely related to the water, the Colorado River and the dam building in some key areas like the, the Echo Park Dam, right? Well, so the whole Colorado River system um, is... Um, it, gosh, it's hard to know how exactly to say this. There are stair-stepped dams throughout the system, and there's uh, it's it's very heavily managed. Both the main stem of the Colorado and also the tributaries. So there's lots and lots of diversions. Thankfully, there are no dams in the Grand Canyon. Uh, just upstream from the Grand Canyon is Lake Powell, which holds the water that is sent downstream from the upper basin states, which is Colorado, Wyoming, Utah, and New Mexico. So the water is staged above the Grand Canyon and then it flows through the Grand Canyon and gets stored again, impounded in Lake Mead behind the Hoover Dam. And, mm -hmm. and then that water is for the lower basin states of California, Arizona, and Nevada. Um, so when you when the Colorado River aqueduct delivers water to you in Los Angeles, that water is basically coming from, it's coming from the upper basin, but it's been stored in Lake Mead. Yeah, so I see that there are people that are making collaborative efforts to find alternative ways to building a dam on the, the Gila River in, the, in New Mexico, right? That, yeah, that's Southwest New Mexico and that dam was stopped. So um, that's a, that, that's really a bright spot in this story that one of the wildest places in North America will not be dammed. And um, and that was a great case of, of people coming together in community, um, both the irrigators, the farmers and, and the cattle, people who raise cattle, ranchers and conservationists came together because they all agreed that this place was so important and they found a way. I mean, it's more nuanced than that, of course, the story is, but they found a way forward where the irrigators are getting what they need and the river is still wild and free. So it's a, it's a really beautiful story. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's good to know there's people still working on that and making a lot of efforts. And the book Living River also talks about the interesting behavior of a couple of swans they're like mysteriously migrated to the grand canyon and then returned as mm -hmm. track um, tracking device it's pretty neat so can you tell me tell us a little bit about that i'll see if i can find a picture can you see my screen right now yeah i can see the the, the screen grand can the grand canyon. Oh, grand canyon yeah so just going through the grand canyon a little bit home of california condors um, I'm going to, I'm just going to skip ahead. Sorry about this, but, um, want to show the swans. So these are trumpeter swans. They are our largest waterfowl species. And, um, and this is at Seedskiddy National Wildlife Refuge in Wyoming. So a long ways from the Grand Canyon, probably a thousand miles or so. And, uh, Several years ago, two collared swans, and there aren't very many collared swans, uh, but two collared swans took off and they flew to the Grand Canyon, hung out for a little while and flew back. And nobody knows why, but it's a really interesting story, the mystery of it, and also the notion that these animals pretty much connected most of the Colorado River watershed through their flight patterns, through their movements. Um, 
And I like that, that there's mysteries, that we don't know everything, and that animals have so much to teach us. Yeah, exactly. Those hydrological cycles, and it's a great way that it's really cool that we can take a closer look at those the dynamic of the nature. And that reminds me of uh, a recent animated movie, Migration. Have you not sure if you, if you heard of it or watched it, but I just watched it last month. It's a pretty lighthearted story about a family of ducks uh, going on a journey to migrate for the first time. So I really enjoy this movie because it's really fun. And this kind of movies um, coming out, it really has this potential to educate children and also adults about wildlife diversity and the importance of conserving the natural habitats. So yeah, that's really cool. And re um, seeing those real pictures that you captured of the swans migrating, that's really a whole new level of awesomeness. <laughs> Thank you. I, I, I have heard of the movie. I haven't watched it yet. I'm glad you did. Um, I, I think, you know, in these times, it's really important that we think of different ways of looking at, you know, what it is, what a watershed is, what it is to be part of a watershed community. And that includes our wild brothers and sisters, right? Mm -hmm. And if we just pay attention and, and, and observe and witness, we can see these animals connecting vast um, landscapes or riverscapes and, uh, and their movements tell us a lot, and and it's really important that we uh, we create the habitat needs uh, or the habitat conditions um, to meet the needs of these creatures, and um, and there's abundant opportunity to do that, even though the river is very much in crisis. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so there are just so many wonderful stories and uh, photographs in your book. So I don't want to do too much of a spoiler here. So if our viewers, if you are interested, definitely check out this book and read for yourself. Um, so next coming up, I'm, I'm more interested in your personal journey and inspiration. So can you tell us a little bit about any specific moments or experience that inspired you to combine your passion for photography with this conservation efforts? That's a wonderful question. And I, I my first instinct is to say that um, it was a lot of little moments and that continues. Um, I think when you do a long project, and part of the reason that I'm, I'm, I really like to do a, a multi-year project is there comes a point where um, you've explored enough, uh, you've witnessed enough to where the project starts to take the lead and the project decides what pictures needs need to be made. And there's, um, th that's just a wonderful place to be where, you know, you're not, you, you kind of get out of your own way and you let the river decide what she wants. And certainly the Grand Canyon trip, um, that three week trip that I mentioned that that was that was one of those experiences that uh, informed so much of this story and this journey. Um, and there were several several raft trips like that. And there's this thing about rafting where by about the third day, you realize that your own heart rate, your own breath, your own rhythm is matched to that of the river. And it's just spectacular to be in that place and to be moving at the same pace as as a great river, um, and so that that's a big part of it. And then there's just lots of witnessing of, you know, wild animals making their living on on the river in these riparian areas, and um, and the backdrop for a lot of this was I was seeing so many stories about a dying river, and 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 you know the river's in crisis, and and it's you know I think it's important to tell everybody that the river is overpromised. And there's less water in the system than there used to be historically. And plus the West has grown to 40 million people. When the 1922 Colorado River Compact was drafted, there were less than a million people in the American West. And now there's 40 million and there's 
two countries and seven US states and two, two Mexican states, all dependent on this, this river that's about one-tenth the size of the Mississippi River. And then there's all of our wild brothers and sisters. So um, we have a big job ahead of us to create some resiliency and balance in this system so all life can thrive. That's wonderful. So um, I think, uh, personally, I don't know a lot of conservation photographer. Is this a big community or is uh, is more, because what I know is there are more photographers who are just taking landscape photographs and um, there are another um, group of people who are the authors who promote conservation. So is there a lot of people doing this right now that combines the conservation and photographer? Yeah, that's a, that's a really cool question because if we break it down a little bit, conservation photography is telling stories so people will care. And, and you can use lots of different mediums to do that. So you can use photography or video. Those would be the two main ones. You can use animation and lots of things. We have many tools available to us, um, but it's developing a story. And, and I think for folks like me, it's about taking people on a journey of sorts with us. And that's what I tried to do with this, this book story is to create the, the feeling of your, we're going on a journey and, and taking people to the river, I felt like was really, really important because if all we have are, are, are stories of a, a dying river and white bathtub rings around reservoirs, nobody's going to care. And, and so um, that's how I approached it. But my colleagues approach it in many different ways. I mentioned the Platte Basin time lapse. So that's out of the University of Nebraska, my friend Mike Forsberg. Um, and, and so they're engaging students and, 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 and teaching these students how to tell stories. And it's, it's wonderful to be a part of that. I'm also in the International League of Conservation Photographers, and there's about 140 of us around the world, each of us telling stories in our own ways, you know, visual stories. So um, it's hard to say if it's a big community, but I, I would say that there's a lot of room for anybody who's out there making pictures and cares about the natural world to tell the story in their own way. And that can be, you know, that can be an Instagram post where you have something to say um, and you share that with, with your universe. So um, I do think that the idea of visual storytelling for conservation is growing significantly. And um, I'm really proud to be a part of the community. Definitely. I think it's a wonderful idea to combine visual with the conservation because it's a really powerful way. And now that the social media is so just around us everywhere. So it's really great. I, I think it's had really good potential. Um, so how have your previous books, The Sage Spirit and The Prayer Thunder, have influenced the direction and development of this new book, Living River? Yeah, speaking of journeys, um, so I was uh, I was in a corporate job when I published the Prairie Thunder book, and that was a situation where um, it's kind of you know it's similar in a way. Each of these projects are similar in that uh, I, I I felt like the Colorado Prairie was misunderstood. You know, grasslands in general are threatened around the world and and this is my home in the Denver area. We live on the short grass prairie of the Great Plains. And so I just, I wanted my work to be up, to be about more than pretty pictures. And at the time, um, that was my first attempt at, at creating a story. And, and I kind of thought I wanted to create a book. Uh, I didn't know how any of that worked. It was another situation of I didn't know what I didn't know. Um, but I just dove in and I did it and developed some partnerships um, with conservation groups regionally. And, and that, was a, that was a good first step. And then I went full-time as a conservation photographer in 2008 and immediately started on the Sage Spirit book because 
Um, that was when the fracking boom took off and lots of drilling for energy in the American West. And so it was chopping up the landscape. And the way I approached that was not to say no more drilling, but to say, let's do things responsibly. And then we, we built that story around greater sage grouse and Gunnison sage grouse because three, they're, they're the umbrella species for 350 other creatures that use the sagebrush sea of the American West. And, and that project was bigger in scale um, than the, the first one. And, and I think it's just a kind of an evolutionary process of learning how to tell a good story, learning how to build partnerships. Um, and, uh, and for me, what I learned from those first two projects was that I could, I could tell a much deeper story if I go deeper into the places that I want to, to bring to life. And so for the Living River book, I spent a lot more time in each place that I went to, to make sure that I, I made the images that I wanted to make. I met the people I wanted to meet and I interviewed them and I, I brought them to life. And, uh, and that made for a really rich experience where I feel part of a much larger community. And I can convey that to readers. Um, you know, that that if I go, if I'm saying to people, you are one of 40 million in the watershed community, I have to feel that sense of community too. And and so um, it was very rewarding to approach this story in that way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm sure there are lots of moments that have sparked this book that make it to life. So why did you choose the name Living River? because <laughs> because I heard so many people say the river is dying and uh and and with the publisher braided river um we we played with lots of different potential titles and it it kept coming back to living river and and it, and the subtitle the promise of the mighty colorado i i think it's really important um in these times when there's a lot of negative press out there to think about that, to think in a hopeful way, to think of the promise of, of rivers and that the river isn't giving up, you know, so we can't give up either. And, and a lot of those thoughts are tied into that idea of, of the living river. And it's, you know, it's also making a statement that we're looking at this watershed in a different way than you know, the folks that are just focusing on dams and reservoirs and canals and water deliveries and all of that stuff, which is all important. But we can't forget that there are rivers and they are amazing. And they support all this life in the American West and the great migrations and 18 million songbirds going across the Colorado River Delta in spring. That's important. It's really important. Yeah, I love the name. And I myself, I grew up right next to the Yangtze River. And every day, my dad would drove me across a three-mile Cable State Bridge to go to school. Mm. So I remember those early mornings when I sat in a car and looked out over the river. I could feel a deep connection to the world around me. And I can, send, I can have this sense of peace and possibility that carry me throughout the day. So I could totally resonate with your bond to the rivers. So if you could have one direct conversation with a Colorado River, what would you say or ask? Before I say that, before I answer, I, I just want to thank you for that really beautiful story from when you were growing up. That That's really touching to me. And I think, um, you know, a lot of my message is about going to the river and and there's and that sounds kind of fluffy but your story is this is similar to many other stories if we touch the river we will be touched back and that stays with us forever and and uh so thank you for that thank you what was the question again uh, yeah so did you have a direct conversation with a colorado river what would you say or ask I've had, I had many conversations. Um, and one of the things I do is every time I go to the river, I get down on my knees and 
I cup my hands and I get some water in my hands from the river and put it on my face. And I tell the river, I love you. I, I love her. And, and I think um, for me, that's, that's a really strong, powerful, emotional connection. Um, yeah, I, I have these conversations about, you know, just keep going. We're, we're, you know, we're doing everything we can for you. And, and uh, I, I talk to her as a person and, and the conversation is different each time. Um, I, I would tell her right now that a lot of people care and don't give up. That's beautiful. Yeah, that's really powerful connection. Okay, so another question comes to is what are the challenges or is there any challenge that you faced during the creation of this book or your previous books? Like when you are working in the ecosystems of the Intermountain West? Oh, there's lots of challenges. Um, you know, sometimes your equipment breaks uh, or uh, the atmospheric conditions aren't what you hoped for. Um, I do a lot of pre-visualization, thinking about the pictures I wish to make and the people that I want to connect with. And oftentimes those things don't go as planned and you have to recalibrate. So there's a lot of um, adjustments that go on um, while in the field. So I wouldn't say any really big things. You know, I, I didn't get, knock on wood, I didn't get injured badly on any of my expeditions or anything like that. Um, it's just, it's lots of little daily challenges to uh, take electronic gear into the field and, uh, and, and try to make the pictures that you have in your head. Um, so yeah, it's, it's, it's never ending. I, I think so much of photography and telling stories is problem solving and, and, uh, redirecting and but that's a beautiful part of it too that those redirections can lead you to places unexpected and wonderful so yeah yeah so what's one piece of equipment or gear that you cannot live without on your trips oh uh gosh or there are more than one piece. There, yeah, there's more than one. So I need a long lens. I need a 600 millimeter lens for wildlife. I can't live without that. Uh, I need a tripod for shooting in low light a lot of the time. For this project, there's a number of drone shots. Um, you can't always just call up Lighthawk and say, I'd like to fly today. You know, that those things have to be planned. So mm -hmm. it was nice to be able to pop a drone up in the air when the conditions were right and, and make some of those pictures. Um, yeah, you know, our gear is so good nowadays that you've got a video camera and a high resolution still camera in your hands at all times. And mm -hmm. I think sometimes though we focus too much on, oh, we got to have the exact right lens and, and that kind of thing. And oftentimes it's a matter of not having all the gear in the world, but just being in the right place and being an open person and letting the story and the, the magic of place flow through us. And if we're open like that, then that leads us to things that are completely unexpected. And, and it's the same way with the telling of the story. It's not, you know, you don't have a fixed narrative going in. The narrative kind of unfolds in its own way. And it's, that business I, I, I spoke of in the beginning about, you know, um, letting the story take the lead. And, and, and I, I think so much of this kind of work is more about being an open person than being, you know, tied to making very specific images. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I can tell you're really, you're a real expert because I recently, I start to engage in a lot of video recording primarily in indoor settings such as libraries and bookstores and as a beginner in photography I generally understand the hassle of carrying cameras and switching gears even though for myself I only just have one small camera I'm sure that capturing a fleeting glimpse of a river or wildlife is 
far more challenging than um, recording a more static environment. So really respect what you do. Thank you. Okay. Um, and so in your books and your social platforms, such as in your website, your Instagram, you not only share images, but also various stories to engender readers' empathy and love for the natural world. So can you share with us how you create this emotional connection with your audience, your readers? I don't, I don't fully know where it all comes from. Um, I just think that uh, the approach has to be one where it comes from a deep place inside of us. And, um, you know, you set out to create a story and the story is bound to change a lot, but you follow your heart and you go out and you make images and you start to make connections. You make connections through people and wildlife and changing weather patterns and changing of seasons. All those things become sort of the rhythm of place, right? And in a sense, the Colorado River isn't a lot of different places. It's all one place because it's the same water no matter where you are. It's, 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 it's the same source and it's all coming together in the main stem of the Colorado River. Um, and to make a personal connection, I think it's about telling your own truth. It's about telling your own story and not being so much concerned about how somebody else is gonna perceive the work, but just tell the most authentic story you possibly can and trust that others are gonna be drawn to it in some way. Um, you just and maybe they will, maybe they won't. You put the best story you can out there. It comes from your heart. You let it go like a little bird. And, you know, you hope people like it. Um, and I think what people like about this story, it, it's it's been one of the really interesting things to me that's gratifying is that no matter where I've gone and no matter what the makeup of the group is, people are pretty much responding the same way. And I think that's because in part because it's a hopeful story in a time when there isn't, you know, a lot of hopeful stories about the Colorado River system. And um, I just try to tell it in the most authentic way I can. Mm -hmm. I am just a vessel. And so as a vessel, I carry the story. I share it with others. Really, as creative people, that's all we can do. And, you know, if if you go about it, in the most authentic way you can, and you tell a layered story and you involve other people and, you, and you've and you got, in this case, river keepers who are doing incredible work, which gives people sort of an entry point into the story. I, I think that's a, that's a pretty good way to approach it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I really like that, being authentic and creative. So you mentioned earlier that before you go out on a trip, you already have some visual image in your mind, what you want to capture. So um, can you share with us more about your writing rituals or the processes that you normally do? Because considering the scope of your project, um, it's pretty long. And so do you write on a day-to-day -day basis or you clap, collect photographs first and then you write afterward? I do a lot of research before I go into the field. The picture behind you um, was 900 miles from my house. Oh. And uh, it was, this was my, that picture was my very first time of seeing the Gila River. And I arrived there and I knew about this place and it was getting to be sunset. Uh, there you go. And, uh, and, and I, I, I kind of knew what I was after and I made that picture and, um, you know, I, I had no idea that it would probably be the best sort of overview of the Gila the picture that I would make. Um, so I'm getting a, a little away from your question. Um, I do this research. I have in my mind kind of an idea of how the pictures I want to structure. Um, 
I don't want to keep making the same picture over and over in different places. Um, I leave a lot of room for serendipity for things that I might witness that are interesting to me that I hadn't thought about. You know, there's on the Gila, there's a picture of wonderful fungi on the side of a cottonwood tree. I, I hadn't thought about that picture, but it was pretty cool. Um, you know, you might be visited by animals that you weren't expecting to see. And so there's an openness to that. I do a, a journaling uh, each day. I make notes. Um, and sometimes the days are really long and the notes will be really short. Other times I draw maps and pictures and, you know, just really stretch out like if it's a warm afternoon and I'm just hanging out. Um, but I want to remember, too, like while I was photographing the beaver, there was a black hawk overhead and there were songbirds. And I want to remember those things. And it's really important that I put them in the journal so you know, I can pull together sort of the whole matrix of life that's happening in a given place. And then I can go back to that when I write. And so that's the extent of my writing while I'm developing the story other than, you know, Instagram posts and stuff like that. And then in this case, we were challenged to put together the book pretty quickly because of the significance of the moment with the Colorado River. Um, and so I wrote all of the first drafts for this book in three months and then went through the editing process with a couple of wonderful editors who really wanted to honor uh, the story I wish to tell and not alter my words too much. And I'm so grateful to Braided River for letting me tell this story in my own way and all the trust they put in me um, to be the carrier of the story. Yeah, it's nice to stay open and open to new perspectives throughout the way. And also uh, really appreciate that you're moving really fast to get your story uh, out to the public and get more people aware of the, the story of Colorado River. So um, how do your collaborations with organizations like Audubon Rockies and the Nature, Nature Conservancy influence your work. Can you show, share an, an example of particular impactful collaboration? I can, and um, but before I do that, just to, to the previous question, I part of the reason that the, the bulk of the writing happens at the end is because the story in your head changes so much over time. I would say that in those seven years, the river and her people changed me profoundly. And, mm -hmm. and so that story became very different. You know, coming out of the pandemic, during the pandemic, I was doing tons of research and reaching out to experts and I was trying to get my story right. Um, it was really important that way. And that engaged more people and more ideas. And, and all of that informs what you see on the page today. Um, it's, it's very much an evolutionary proce process. Uh, with respect to the conservation groups, I seek out people who are doing great work and, and I do the research on the work that they're doing. Um, there are wonderful um, collaborations going on in the conservation space for the Colorado right now. I have partnered with Audubon Rockies on all of my projects and they're, um, Allison Holleran, who runs Audubon Rockies, is one of my best friends, and and um, we just we just find ways to work together. But Audubon also is doing, you know, really important scientific research. Um, you wouldn't think of doing raft trips with a birding organization, but all those birds in the arid west have to go to the river. They have to go to the riparian zone. In fact, all the animals have to go to the river because the landscape is so parched. And, and that's, you know, that's the case everywhere, but um, it's, it's in the arid West, particularly the Southwest, it, it becomes increasingly important. Um, the Nature Conservancy, I was introduced to them by my Platte Basin time-lapse friends on the Gila River. And um, they had a farm right on the Gila River. And they, so they 
also were an irrigator. They were they leased the farm to be um, to be to produce crops, uh, you know, basically hay. But but because of that, Martha at the Nature Conservancy, Martha Cooper had a seat at the table with the farmers, and that's part of how that collaboration came together. Is is people just kept showing up and talking and starting to find common ground. And this is where conservation is at its very best. And eventually they start to agree on some stuff. And you end up with an agreement that stops a dam that would have killed the upper Gila right in that picture behind you. And, and, and now it's still free flowing and wild. And so that was just such a natural fit to work with the Nature Conservancy and to, to help to work with them to tell that story. And that's kind of how it goes with the conservation uh, groups is, is you find the people that are doing the best work. And, um, you know, I'll just call these folks up and say, I'm Dave, I'm doing, I'm doing, telling this story. I really like what you're doing. Can we meet? And we meet and we agree on some stuff and we agree to work together. And uh, ultimately we, we end up becoming friends and partners and the whole bit. And, and that's a big part of what I love about this work. Yeah, it's great that you are open to reaching out to people and to organizations. So in your book, you also share a lot of pictures and stories of individual river keepers. So how do you get to know these inspiring people along the journey? Are you more a people person by nature or you're just more drawn to the like-minded individuals? Such a good question, Kathy. Um, I would say, so when I started, you know, you asked me about kind of how those first projects informed this project. When I started, I was really shy about approaching people. And so there weren't a lot of people in my stories in the beginning. It was a lot about the natural world. Pragmatically, if we want people to care, they need to see other people who are giving love and empathy for the river, for the land, whatever your story is. Mm -hmm. So it's really important that we feature people doing important work in our stories. And um, so I didn't know who, who those people would be that would, you know, in the very beginning of the river story, I had some ideas. Um, I knew Kirk Clanky, the Trout Unlimited president, president in the headwaters uh, I didn't know how important Kirk would be to the story, but I reached out to him. We, 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 we had many conversations. We went to the river together. It's, it's so organic. And, and, and at some point I'm like, this, this is, this guy's a perfect fit. I, I really, and he's my friend now. And, and I, I really need to incorporate him to the story, into the story. And I didn't know how that would be, um, at first, but, um, you just trust that in time um, you're going to just find the right note and and bring in the right people. Um, and I, what I do is I work with somebody for quite a while, for a period of years before I ask them if they want to be a part of the story. Um, and, and, and I want to build a good amount of trust. <laughs> it's a hard thing to write a profile of a person, a living person who is your friend to write about them. It's a lot easier for me to write about a bobcat or a trumpeter swan. And um, and so I want to build a lot of trust. Um, I didn't know that Anne Castle would emerge as the person that wrote our forward. And, and she's just this incredible leader in the watershed and was appointed by Joe Biden to be the commissioner for the Upper Colorado River Basin and um, and is a dear friend. And, and so... I think the way to answer your question is to say um, you have to trust yourself and then you have to build trust in others. And it, it's that authenticity piece too, right? You're just being yourself. You're doing the work. You know that you can't tell the story by yourself. You can't do that. We, it, it takes a coalition basically to tell a big story of a big landscape and this this river is fourteen hundred and fifty miles long, and so these people doing incredible work uh, are heroic, and and their stories need to be told, and 
And uh, I'm really grateful that, you know, the way the chapters worked out, that we had incredible people in every chapter. Um, yeah. And it turned out a lot of them are women. <laughs> it's great to have a lot of people in your book. So about the audience, who who is the intended audience and what is the message that you hope to convey? The audience, it, it's uh, it's it's pretty easy to just say everybody, um, but but there's kind of two layers. Um, if you think about policymakers, that's that's sort of one subset of the forty million people that live in the watershed, people that are making policy. Um, then there's different water users, there's the agriculture people that 80% of the river goes to agriculture. And then there's the 40 million other people. And I think there's a big gap between, in understanding the moment between policy and the 40 million residents in the Colorado River watershed. The role our story plays is to bring people together around the river. And, and I think for policy people who are legislating on how we're going to change up the allocations in the lower part of the river in Arizona, California, and Nevada, um, how we're going to balance the two big reservoirs, those are very different conversations than people are having around their kitchen table, um, you know, that are just just living their lives. Yet, the river is the common thread. It brings us all together. So for policy people who spend a lot of time in meetings deciding how we're going to figure things out, our story brings them to the river and reminds them that the river still matters. And for instance, when I was in Las Vegas and I gave a presentation at the Colorado River Water Users Association Conference to decision makers, I was able to say, please consider the health of our rivers with every decision you make. And that was really important to me to convey that message. And for other folks, I can go to another audience and I might have a slightly different message. And a lot of that is about taking them to the river vicariously through our story and then suggesting that everybody go to the river and touch and be touched by this incredible watershed and, and find our own relationship because really for all of the people of the watershed, it's about reimagining our relationship to water during a period of extreme drought and extreme climate change um, impacts on this watershed. So I think you can take the story just about anywhere and there's gotta be a little bit of nuance in how we tell it based on who it is that we're meeting with. But what I really want is for all these folks to, to just come to that place of saying, wow, this is such an amazing place to make our lives, you know, um, to be a part of this watershed. And, um, and that there's a lot of life worth saving and, uh, and it's on all of us. So it's, it's a bit of a universal story, I guess. That's good. So since you mentioned the audience is quite wide and um, so during your book tour, you um, I think you probably presented your message to various groups like scholars and uh, policymakers, government, local communities, universities or elementary schools. So um, how do uh, how would you say for the reception of the book so far? Is there any interesting comments, feedbacks, or questions that you received from the various groups of audience? Yeah, uh, people have really responded to the story. I, I think it's a little bit unexpected in part because um, people aren't seeing the places that I traveled to. They're not being exposed to these stories of abundant dynamic life wherever the river flows. Mm -hmm. So um, so I think there's that slight element of surprise. 
Uh, I've had water managers in a number of places say thank you for taking us to the river and reminding us that sh she is still there. Um, in part, because not that's not any commentary on the people. It's just that their focus is so strong on filling reservoirs and delivering water to downstream users, which is important. It's all important. Um, and others, I've had people tell me I've never heard um, anybody talk about the river in this way. And, uh, and so I like that. I like it that we're, we're showing them something different. And, uh, and I think, you know, and then there's the people who have had deep experiences in the, in the river and it's an affirmation, right? Somebody who's been on a raft trip, somebody who has backpacked and stood on a mountain pass and looked across a vast landscape that's all part of this watershed. So, so they, they can make that connection. And it's really, I think people make a connection to story in their own way. And, and that's what we want, right? Like somebody's gonna really get the Bears Ears chapter because they've had a rich experience in Southern Utah. Somebody else is gonna go, wow, you know, the, the, I remember that stuff from my raft trip and, and what it felt like to feel this big in a giant place. And, and those reminders are important too. The world's pretty jaded today. The news isn't very good a lot of the time. We need to be amazed. We need to tap into that sense of wonder and curiosity and beauty that's all part of the human condition, you know? And, and I wanna give people whatever access point they would like to enter the story at and, and, and let them explore in their own way. And I, I think, I think that's, that's a good way to, I, I think as I process, have processed this and gone around telling these stories to different folks, I've decided that, you know, for, for a long time, conservation was a lot of hard advocacy. Like you got to go to meetings and you got to write letters and you got to do all this stuff to save a place or a species. And, and in my mind, I think today that conservation needs to feel more like an invitation. You know, like, hey, come on, I want to show you something really cool and invite people to come along with us um, in a non-threatening way. And that, that feels right to me. Mm -hmm. So what would be a good angle to educate our children, young children um, about the rivers because they probably have little to none knowledge of this? Yeah, just take them to the river. Even if it's, even if it's the local creek that's running through your community, um, it all flows to the big river, right? And so I think with kids, uh, our job, I, I so appreciate this question. Um, our job is to just get kids outside, not looking at screens and let them skip rocks in the river. Um, let them splash, let them explore. Um, those of us have had who've had those kinds of experiences as kids often, you know, recall those experiences as, as moments that really informed who we are as people. And, mm -hmm. um, and so we need to just let kids be free and, and be kids. And um, nobody's gonna care unless they go to the river, whether you're a kid or you're a jaded mm -hmm. old person, um, it doesn't matter. If we take people to the river, um, then we have a chance. And it's particularly yeah. important with kids. And I recently gave a presentation to my daughter Kelly's fifth grade class in Palm Springs. Mm -hmm. And those kids were so locked in and they asked the best questions. And I, I don't think we give kids enough credit. They were brilliant kids and, um, and they got it, you know? And, and I have no doubt that some of those kids are gonna ask their parents, can you take me to the river? Um, I just think that, you know, exposing young people um, to new ideas and new places and, and to the joy and the fun of splashing in the river, um, that's a nice place to start. you share any of the, the fun questions that the children ask? 
<laughs> One little girl asked me, Mr. Showalter, what keeps you going? That was, uh, that kind of blew my mind. That one really stuck with me. There were questions like, what was your favorite wildlife experience? Um, what was your favorite place? There was those kinds of questions too. Um, but yeah, there was, there was some really insightful questions and, uh, but just to see kids um, so tuned in where we're, we were just in sync, you know, and they weren't distracted. They were really into being exposed to the Colorado River watershed. Um, that was a really, really beautiful moment. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I believe the children's curiosity is really powerful that can bring the new generation, the younger generations to help us in protecting rivers. Um, so during these years um, of your journey, um, how has your perspective on nature and conservation evolved? I'm sure it has, as you said, the river has changed you a lot in profound ways, right? Absolutely. Um, so there's a lot of space for nature to just work its wonders on my soul, right? Or for any of us. There's there's that part of, of you know, I'll share a, a little anecdote. Early on, I did a tour of Seedskiddy National Wildlife Refuge in Wyoming, which is the Green River, which is the first or is the biggest tributary of the Colorado. Mm -hmm. And and I saw golden eagles and pronghorns and trumpeter swans and on and on, you know, just so many animals. And, and I, I texted my friend, Mike Forsberg, who's plant based in time lapse. And I said, Mike, I don't even know where to start in this place. There is so much wildlife richness. And Mike texted me back and he goes, just go to the river and breathe. And I started doing that. I just started going to the river. Lots of times I would put camouflage on and I would just sit there. And I would kind of have an idea in my head that maybe trumpeter swans would come by or river otters would show up. And you do that enough and you realize, my God, there's all of this life. You know, it's 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 just incredible. And and so that was that was a really important, I, I think, idea that you can just sit there and just be and let the river work its magic on you. Um, and what was the other part of the question? Um, so basically it's just uh, about how the nature and the river can have uh, can have the change or the power of influence on a person. Yeah, so that's that part. But the other part in terms of storytelling was um, I've I've realized, and this has taken some time, that it's largely about community. It's about um, tapping into various communities and and become becoming part of a bigger river community, and um, and that it's really important that we engender community with our conservation stories. It's not about Dave going off into the wilderness and coming back with a story. It's about Dave endeavoring to be part of a larger community and going out and seeking people that are doing incredible work and knitting it all together somehow. But um, all of us sort of sharing part of the load. And it's kind of a metaphor in that sense for the moment where we're in where there's less water. So 40 million people are all going to have to figure out how to live with less water mm -hmm. and we need to row together. We can't just be like this all the time, you know, just just battling one another. Um, so I have this grander sense of how important it is uh, to be a part of a bigger community and to to try to to build community around our ideas. Yeah. So sometimes we see the news of some areas having drought. So do you think it's more like a temporary? thing or it's more threatening for a long-term long-term scenario yeah thanks for that question um the word drought to me implies uh that that it's a short-term thing mm -hmm. um 
and that we're going to get over it and then there'll be rain and everything will be back to normal again. And the word that's a couple of words that are being used for the Colorado River watershed are aridification or desertification or mega drought. And we've been in a very dry period now for going on 24 years, started in the year 2000. And there's been in those 24 years, there's been three wet years and every all the other years have been extremely dry. And that's driving uh, what we're seeing in shortages downstream from the headwaters and it's impacting people significantly now. And, and we've known about this for decades, but it's complicated to find solutions. A lot of, a lot of straws in the river, so to speak, a lot of people involved. But the moment is one where the climate models say it's not going to get wet again. It's going to continue to dry out and we have to learn to use less water. It's not necessarily a bad thing because we haven't been living within our means for decades. Mm -hmm. So we were going to need to figure it out anyway. Um, and I like, to, I like to talk about it in terms of mega drought because that gives us a window to discuss how, how significant it is that we're in a 24 year cycle right now. And it, the models suggest that it's gonna to continue to go that way. And as we speak, I was just in the, I was just up at 12,000 feet on New Year's Day in the headwaters of the Colorado, and there's not very much snow up there. And we're way, way behind on snow already in this water year. Um, so mega drought is, is that's just the times we're in. And, uh, and so how is it going to impact, impact, you know, normal people? Well, regular folks, we're probably going to end up doing, for instance, a lot less uh, irrigating of, ornamental lawns, you know, we'll, we'll probably be tearing out lawns and xeriscaping because when we dump water on the ground, it's just gone for good. Um, and, and, you know, there's going to be lots of little examples like that of small things that individuals can do that when we scale it up, it can make a big difference. And, and apart from that, there's probably going to be some pretty heavy cuts to allocations. Um, it's going to be a more with less a <laughs> do with less scenario, but um, but I think a lot of folks understand we can do a lot better with the rivers we have. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I'm sure there are a lot of photographers who are uh, willing to get into this field. And um, so, what are the advice that you would give to a uh, aspiring? photographers who wants to make a difference in conservation, environmental awareness? I, uh, I'm i fortunate to work with a, a, quite a number of really talented young photographers who are doing exactly what you just described. They're learning how to tell a good story. They want to be conservation photographers. I would say work really close to home uh, for your first story. Um, but I think all of us that are doing it full time have uh, close to home projects that we're doing. I have a project that's seven miles away um, from my house on the prairie. If you work close to home, you can be there just about any time. You know how the light falls across the land. You know how the animals move and you can and, you know, people and you can build a, a, a story. And I, I think just don't think too grandiose in the beginning. Just just go tell a story, uh, something that's close to your heart. Work on stringing together a number of images and, and think about a three, three picture story and a five picture story and start making connections and talking to folks who are doing good work. Trust yourself and see where it'll lead. And, and also the other thing I see a lot in social media is somebody will post an amazing picture or a series of pictures mm -hmm. and they don't have anything to say. They just go Monument Valley, Utah, and you go, what about the indigenous people? What about the, you know, all of the different features of this landscape, whatever. Um, I think it's important to have something to say. And if we try to have something to say and we make, you know, good captions that are mini stories and take people on a journey, which is the whole deal, just take people on a journey with you 
and trust yourself and trust your story, see where it takes you. Yeah, it's really important to um, transit your mindset from a like a traveler or a viewer into someone who can um, to grow from the the picture into some meaningful image and to meaningful information and meaning to the audience to spread the message. So um, on that, what are the future projects or books that you are planning on? <laughs> I'm not uh, thinking about any more books right now. I'm going to take some time and keep telling this story. I am, uh, but I have a couple of other things going on, spinoff projects that are connected to the Living River story. So for instance, I have a time-lapse camera that's near the Mexican border that is, um, it's in a cottonwood tree and it's looking at a dry section of the San Pedro River. And what that uh, camera is doing is it's shooting a one picture per daylight hour and it's documenting the hydrological cycle of that river. So the water comes into the, the river channel and very quickly drains down into the aquifer underneath the river. And so it's a really, I think it's a really interesting way of, of looking at, at a Southwest river, a wild Southwest river that's got big problems because of groundwater depletion. So looking at it in a different way, I'm thinking about a story that I'm presently calling river of birds, which would be a migration story back to us talking about migrations. Um, and that notion that 18 million songbirds cross the Colorado River Delta, and then they follow river channels as they travel north on spring migration. And by May, they're basically falling in my lap up here in Colorado because that's, that's where they come. So they make this journey that connects the whole watershed and through their lives and their movements and their, 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 their habitat needs, we can look at rivers in a different way. So I'm, I'm thinking about that, you know, I'm thinking a lot about a lot of things and it's a nice place to be to, to where I can explore ideas pretty freely. And, and just as I travel around and think about, okay, how do I want to keep telling this? Who do I want to take on the journey with me? And, um, and how does it inform our understandings of our place in the watershed? And that's kind of what you want to get to is, is I think for people to feel not just part of a bigger community, but feel a deep connection to place. And, and the, one of the biggest challenges I think we have in a, in a pretty fragmented world where there's lots of things tugging at us for our attention is, is, is to think in terms of we are part of nature. We are connected to nature. There's no separation. We don't have a life here in the American West without these rivers. And, and, and it's one thing to say that, and it's a whole nother thing for people to feel it. And, and, um, and those are the stories I want to tell in are those that bring people closer to that idea of feeling no separation between ourselves and the watershed between ourselves and the natural world. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. So that's really good conclusion. And I think that's all for my questions that I prepared so Dave, do you have any closing closing thoughts for for this discussion? I would say uh, for all of us, it's it's really important to step outside of our day-to-day -day lives and take time to, to go to nature and to breathe and to not think of nature as a separate place, but as the same place and as our home and um, to be open to being, uh, to being moved, to being touched, to being uh, deeply affected by our time in the natural world. And, and to take the time, you know, we, we don't stop in our daily lives. We just go, 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 go. And, and that idea of go to the river and just breathe is, is magical. To take the time, to be, it's almost meditative 
to 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 go to a favorite place and to let it soak into us and take kids and let them have that joy, that wonderful experience of playing in nature. Um, there's a there's a great big world out there to be explored. And uh, it's one of the most wonderful things about the human condition that we can go just about anywhere in this day and age and go on an exploration um, and let that uh, inform our journey in however way it will, but it's bound to be wonderful. It's beautiful. And I would like to share my favorite quote from the book. In this book, Dave said, there may just be enough water for people, wildlife, and life in flow when we become the river. The Colorado River is not dying and our narr narrative must change. The river flows with the same pure purpose as before we arrived. And that concludes our discussion for today. Thank you, Dave, again, for taking the time to share your stories and insights with us. Really appreciate your great work to spread the stories, messages that people need to hear, and also in a very beautiful way that people are happy to pay attention to. So I look forward to hearing or reading more about your new projects. Um, and now if you are audience, if you are interested in Dave's book, Live in River, feel free to check out this book from your local bookstore or library. And don't forget to follow Dave on his website and Instagram. I will probably put those links in the description box. And again, thank you all, my friends. Thank you, Dave. And this is Library Hunter. See you next time. Bye. Thank you so much.